Hi, this is Dan Lynch. I'm with the Pennsylvania Game Commission, and this is a segment um, for the study session for the Envirothon um, in the wildlife section. Um, today, we're going to start out talking uh, about the, the skull section, um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the scat and the tracks of the wildlife. Now, you've got to remember, even though I have the real skulls here, um, on the contest, you're going to be seeing pictures of the skulls. And those pictures are listed in the study guide on the envirothonpa.org website. Um, just thought it would make it a, a little bit uh, easier if you actually saw some of the skulls. But um, on, in this year, in the county and the state, uh, you're gonna be seeing the pictures of the skulls. But they'll be these animals um, that I brought along today. So I'll start off by talking about one of the larger skulls. And uh, this is a Pennsylvania black bear skull. Uh, this uh, black bear is an omnivore, and what's important about the skull, obviously, uh, in addition to this, the overall size of it, um, are, is the dentition and the type of teeth that the bear has. It's important to know the different types of teeth. So the, the teeth in the front are called incisors, uh, the large pointy ones are called canines, um, and the ones in the back are molars. The first few molars are called premolars, but in general, all of these are molars. Uh, what makes it very obvious that the black bear is omnivore are the types of molars that they have. They're very, very similar to our teeth in that they are pretty much flattened molars in the back, primarily for grinding plants. Um, even though the bear is an omnivore, about 80% of its diet is made up of plant matter. So having these flattened molars back here helps a whole lot uh, in the bear being able to grind up and digest plant matter. So it is important to um, not just to be able to see relative size, but to have a little bit of idea um, on, on the bear skull, you know, what teeth are, are, which, are which ones. What's also important, um, another uh, tip or a characteristic of teeth, there's sometimes space in between the molars and, and the canines. That space is called a diastema. Um, that is also a key term that you need to know what is the space called in between the teeth. So there's important things that you, you need to know when you're studying the Envirothon study materials, um, and we just thought it'd be a good idea to show you some real skulls. <clears throat> the next skull um, would be very, very similar if, if any of you have a pet dog at home um, and you were happen to pull up his, his uh, lips there and take a look, you should see teeth like that because this is a canine. Uh, this one happens to be a coyote. Um, the coyote is an omnivore as well. What's interesting about the coyote, um, he also has the incisors in the front, very, very large canines. Um, he's got the molars. Uh, the very, very back molar is somewhat flattened. Um, however, he's got a lot of pointed teeth on the, on the molar, and that's for breaking bones and grinding meat, uh, ripping flesh, things like that, uh, which is what the coyote spends a lot of time doing, although the coyote is an omnivore. Um, many times you will see, normally on adult male coy uh, coyote skulls, is you'll see this little crest that sticks up on the very, very back. Um, that is called a sagittal crest. Um, that's very, very prominent on a, on a coyote, as well as a possum. And uh, today we're not gonna worry too much about possum skulls, but they also have this sagittal crest on them. Jumping around to a different type of skull would be this one, and this is a herbivore. Um, the herbivore, um, this one has very, very bright orange teeth in the front, um, and it has one set of teeth that are missing, and that is the canines. So it has the incisors missing, the canines, and has extremely flat molars in the back. So this is a herbivore, um, this is a beaver, and it has a huge diastema, very large gap in between two sets of teeth. So that's really important. Um, if you were to also look and cover up where the cheekbones are right here, you'll see that it has very, very tiny eyes for the size of the skull, which is a characteristic of the beaver. They have very, very poor eyesight, but they have very, very good sense of smell and sense of hearing, but very poor eyesight, very, very tiny skulls for such a large skull. Uh, tiny eyes for such a large skull. And then looking at these uh, uh, in, uh, yeah, molars in the back, they're extremely flat. There's nothing pointy about them at all, and that is for grinding up uh, bark and other plants because this guy is strictly a herbivore. So that's the beaver. <clears throat> this one is very, very similar um, to the coyote, although the shape is different. It's, it's much more round on the top and everything is, is much smaller in comparison. But this is very, very common. This is a raccoon. And the raccoon, again, has incisors, canines, and very, very pointy molars. The very, very back two molars are somewhat flattened. 
because again, the raccoon is an omnivore. When you're looking at this particular skull, it's kind of what I would call baseball shaped or softball shaped, um, which is a characteristic of this type of skull. So when you're looking at different skulls like this, you want to look at their shapes. Okay, the coyote is very elongated, uh, whereas this one is ball shaped um, and has very, very large eye sockets. Um, that is characteristic of a feline. So our only feline in Pennsylvania is the bobcat, so that's what this has to be. So when you open it up, you will see that, or when you're looking at that paper on the, on the uh, study guide, you'll see that it's got incisors, it's got very, very sharp canines, and yet all of its molars are pointed, no flattened molars. And that is characteristic of a carnivore. Um, so this guy is not gonna eat any plants, he's strictly a meat eater, and that's your bobcat. <clears throat> the next skull is extremely flattened. So if you compare it to the bobcat that's round, this guy's got a very, very flattened skull. And the reason for that is this guy wants to be aerodynamic while it's swimming. And so now you've got this flattened skull, which, which cuts down on drag while it's swimming, so it can swim very, very fast after fish. And when you open it up, you will see that there are no flattened molars in the back. So no flattened molars gives the appearance that this must be a carnivore, which it is. And this is a member of uh, the weasel family. This is an otter. And the otter has very, very tiny eye sockets. Um, its eyesight is, and the eyes are very, in the front, like predator. Um, so he's got very, very uh, sharp canines. Um, they're a little bit thicker than, than a bobcat. Um, and all the molars are short um, and, and pointed. So they're all for tearing flesh, um, grabbing hold of a, pre, a predator, or a prey species. So this guy is gonna eat fish. Um, he'll eat any animals he can catch on land, but it's a very, very interesting skull and it's probably the flattest and, and kind of elongated skull. So those are some of the characteristics that would give that guy away. <clears throat> Last skull in the contest is this one. Very, very large, um, huge eye sockets. The eyes are on the side of the head, which gives it um, the fact that it's a prey species because the eyes are on the side as opposed to in the front. Um, when you open it up, you'll see that he's missing. He's got no incisors in the top. And Right away, that should be the giveaway. No incisors on the top is gonna to make this a deer. Um, now, they do, if you look up the dentition, they do actually have canines. The last two teeth on each side on the incisors in the bottom are considered canines. They're not pointy like those of a coyote, but they are. So you gotta be careful, that could be a really good question, you know, what prey species has canines? Um, and that would be the white-tailed deer. They have a very large diastema, that is that space in between the two sets of teeth. And the molars in the back, there, if, it, if the deer is an adult, there are six molars in the back. Uh, some of them are, have cusps on them. They either have two cusps or three cusps. And the cusps and the number of molars are what we use to age deer, uh, which is also a, possibly a question on the test, is talking about how do you age an animal. And we age them by their types of teeth they have and the number of teeth and the amount of wear on their teeth. As the deer gets older and older, all these little cusps that are pointed will start to get worn down from chewing on twigs and bark and things like that um, uh, to the point where if the deer is very, very old, eight, nine years old, they may be worn all the way down to the gum at that point. Um, so um, there's definitely some differences in shape um, and size of these skulls. So it's important to check out your, um, the study guide because it gives you all that information on these particular skulls um, for the Envirothon contest. <clears throat> the next segment we're going to talk about um, is the scat or examples of sign that animals leave behind. At the contest you won't see any real scat. You're going to most likely see this rubber or plastic scat. Um, so I'm going to give you some characteristics of the different animals so that you can try to you know, distinguish between the different ones. Um, we could use scat from a lot of different animals. All the animals are listed um, on the wildlife identification sign portion of the contest. When we get to the tracks, there are only certain tracks that we, we, you can see on the contest, and I have all of them here today. So we'll talk about some of the scat. Some of it's pretty obvious. If you see scat that's this large, there's really only one animal in Pennsylvania that could leave scat this large, and that would be a Pennsylvania black bear. Uh, Pennsylvania black bear scat is normally uh, flat on the ends, 
Um, and obviously, all of the scat depends on the actual diet that the animal's eating. If they're eating a lot of berries, or they're eating corn, or whatever, you're going to see that in the scat. Um, but in the, in the repless scat, or the rubber scat we're using for the contest, if it's this large, truly can only be one animal in Pennsylvania, and that is a black bear. This particular scat um, is kind of flattened. There's no real shape to it, but it's got a lot of white on it that's supposed to represent scales. So that's your identifying feature. It's got scales in it. If it's got scales in it, made from fish or crayfish or something like that, there's a really good chance then that this would be an otter scat. So if you see this repless scat that has a lot of scales in it, um, the answer to that one would be otter because that's normally what you're going to find in a lot of otter scat. <clears throat> this particular scat um, would be green if it's fresh and if it's been sitting there for a little while, a few days, it's going to be black. And this is from a muskrat. So they're very, very small. Um, they're kind of cylindrical, pelleted type, uh, much thinner than, let's say, a, a deer. Um, and they're going to be very prominently placed. Muskrats don't just leave their droppings for any particular reason. They're leaving signs telling other muskrats, this is our territory. So if there's any rock or a log sticking out along the creek, they're going to go and leave their droppings right on top of that rock or scat for all the other muskrats to see that this is their territory. So it's just another sign or another example of how evidence leaves some, or animals leave sign. These two are very, very similar. Um, and um, normally they're somewhat pointed at the ends and these are from canines. Now it's a little hard to distinguish them um, between a coyote and a fox, but normally um, the fox is gonna be a little bit smaller than, than a coyote. And again, there's nothing, these are rubber scat, there's nothing in them, but real scat would have hair in it, uh, would have possibly shells in it from uh, uh, anything else that the animal might be eating, or pieces of grain, or pieces of berries, depending on what the animal's eating. But normally with, with canines, you're going to find them cylindrical and pointed or twisted at the end. That's the identifying feature of coyote and fox. And again, normally the, the fox would be larger than, than, or fox would be smaller than the coyote. <clears throat> this cat's normally not ever seen because normally this animal leaves it in the water. Um, it's primarily made up of sawdust or shavings from the wood particles that it's eating. So obviously this is the beaver. Um, if you find and see this in the water, it's very, very fresh. The beaver was just there because it doesn't take very long for the water to break down all the shavings in the, in the scat and it just kind of washes away. Um, so again, they're usually large pellets just like that. And so that would be the beaver sign. <clears throat> A couple of these are, are very similar. We've got reddish and brown colored pellets, normally with a point on one end. Um, so the two animals that would leave these um, I usually consider this a chocolate-covered raisinets. Chocolate-covered raisinets are very, very common. This is a white-tailed deer. You can find this in your backyard, you can find it in the woods, you can find it in the fields. It's all over the place, but it's pelleted normally. Um, and uh, there's usually a point on one end. If you find the red-colored raisinets, that's a porcupine. And a porcupine is going to leave that because porcupine is eaten, eating almost exclusively um, hemlock, fir, um, different types of pine trees that have a lot of tannin, tannic acid, in um, the uh, bark. So the tannic acid actually turns the pellets red. Um, another tip on porcupine is they will defecate as they go in and out of their den almost every time so there's a huge pile of droppings in front of their den. And it's thought that that is one way to try to deter predators from coming in the den. They literally have to crawl over top of a huge pile of porcupine droppings. So, another little tidbit. Um, this one is also sometimes confused with the pellets of a deer, um, but if they're round and they are kind of granulated, kind of like kick cereal, um, this is rabbit or cottontail. So, kick cereal looking uh, pellets um, versus raisinets. So, the round ones are normally the rabbit, the raisinets are normally the white-tailed deer. Last one that I brought along here is long green tubular, usually has some white on it. Also very easily found around schools, on ball fields, um, in parks, nice big open areas on the sidewalk, nice big open areas near ponds. Um, this is Canada Goose um, and it's, sometimes it's a huge pile of these green things and it's green when it's fresh, it's 
black when it's when it's been sitting there for a couple of days. But it's a real common one um, that you'll find everywhere in Pennsylvania. So those are some examples of the scat that you may see in the Envirothon contest. And again, you're not going to see the real stuff. You're going to see either rubber or plastic. Last segment has to do with the tracks. And um, these tracks that I brought along today are the only ones that you have to, there's certain ones that you can and can't um, uh, have listed on the, on the contest. These are all listed on the contest. Uh, so the first one is an example of the hind foot and the front foot of the same animal. The front foot kind of looks like our hand. It's got five toes, um, no webbing in between, where the hind foot has five toes and it has webbing in between for swimming. So this is a beaver. So the beaver's hind foot is very, very large with webbing in between and the front foot. Um, many times you can't see it in the mud because as the front steps down, the hind steps on top of it and washes that track away and you it's very, very hard to see the front foot normally in the mud or the snow. Uh, but this is a, a beaver, very, very distinguishable um, because of that large foot and the webbing. <clears throat> Two of the cervids or the members of the deer family that you might see are very, very similar, but as you can see in size is, is very different. Uh, this is a very, very common found everywhere in Pennsylvania, and that's a white-tailed deer. Um, and you can see kind of the two toes that are pointed, um, kind of heart-shaped. Uh, where this particular one is not going to be found everywhere in Pennsylvania. We have Pennsylvania elk in maybe five or six counties of Pennsylvania. But if you see something that's this large, almost looks like a cow, sort of, um, that has got to be an elk. So you're going to see two different, two possibly different uh, members of the deer family. The huge one is going to be the elk. The small one is going to be the whitetail. This is not an overly large track, um, but it is too big to be anything but uh, Pennsylvania black bear. Uh, black bear is going to have five toes, it's going to have a long heel pad, sometimes in a track they don't always show up perfectly. Um, the hind foot um, is usually smaller than the front foot. The front foot is usually wider at the top, um, but the, uh, on, for some weird reason the, the hind foot is normally smaller than the front foot on a black bear, but if you see a track that's this big, it can really only be one thing. Uh, with those five toes and, and pointed claws, and that is a Pennsylvania black bear. Black bears walk with their toes out all the time. They do, do not retract them. Uh, so many times you will see um, toenail marks in the track. Speaking of retracting, um, this animal normally walks around with its claws retracted. So you're only going to see the toe pads. And you will see a heel pad in the back. And normally you'll see these four toes it's normally hard to see the fifth toe because it's up higher on the foot, but that would be a Pennsylvania bobcat. So the bobcat, you're going to see the heel pad and probably four toe pads, but no claw marks because they walk retracted. Just the opposite is you're going to see a heel pad, four toe marks, and normally some, toe, some claw marks on a canine. Um, now these are rubber tracks. They're not perfect. They're rubber tracks. The, the fox is normally a little more round that you're going to see in the track and you're also going to see what is the shape of a boomerang in the heel pad. So if you see that boomerang shape in a heel pad, kind of an upside down V, um, that's a good example of a fox track. Where if you see a heel pad, four toe pads, and claw marks, but normally elongated, normally about two and a half inches from the, the heel or the, uh, yeah, the heel to the tip of the toe, that's a coyote. So the canines are very, very similar. What you want to keep in mind is normally a more round track is going to be a fox, and a more elongated or oval shape is going to be a coyote. You're always going to see um, toe, toenail marks if you follow the track long enough um, because they do not retract their, their claws, so they're going to be out. <clears throat> see a track that is kind of kidney bean shaped, very, very long toenails. Um, the, that's, that's kidney bean shape is characteristic of a porcupine. And they are also, they also walk pigeon toed. So if you were to see the tracks, you would see this, how they're kind of angling in as they're walking. But very, very kidney bean shape with very, very long toenails. And those toenails are used for climbing. Um, that's a porcupine. Good characteristic of this particular track is a thumb. You're going to see a thumbprint sticking out. 
There's only one animal that has this thumb sticking out, and that is a possum. Um, the possum will use that thumb to kind of hold on to branches as it's climbing, um, but they have this opposable thumb, kind of like we do, where our fingers come this way and our thumb comes this way, they can do the exact same thing. Um, so it sort of looks like a baby, a human baby's foot footprint, but that is, if you see that track, can only be one animal, and that is a possum. This track is, the white kind of throws you off that it has something that the animal is white. It's, it's not. It's just the way they make these tracks, but this is the hind foot of a cottontail. The hind foot of a cottontail is totally furred, and it's very, very difficult to actually see the toe pads in it. Occasionally you do, um, but if you see the track that's very, very long, um, and it looks like it's fully furred all the way along the entire foot, um, that's going to be a cottontail rabbit. <clears throat> this, I happen to have a front and a hind foot of this particular animal, and, and don't be thrown off by the color. The color is, has nothing really to do with it at all. Um, so this has got an elongated foot, uh, a hind foot, and a very, very tiny front foot. Uh, the elongated hind foot with really, really long toes and webbing in between them is from a muskrat. And again, a muskrat is a semi-aquatic species, going to spend a lot of time swimming, and their hind foot is much, much longer than their front foot. This is a hind foot of a very small animal as well, one that you'll see in the same areas, same locations as the muskrat, because this guy's hunting for the muskrat. And this is the hind foot of a mink. And a mink, you're gonna see five toes sticking out, and you're gonna see um, a bumpy heel pad. And this guy's got three or four bumps on his heel pad. It's probably difficult to see that on the camera, but uh, if you see that track, you see the bumpy heel pad and five toes sticking out and an elongated foot, that's the hind foot of a mink. <clears throat> this guy's very short, round foot. Um, he has very, very little hair in between there. Um, it kind of looks like a miniature bear track. Looks like a miniature bear track. And this is from a skunk. Um, and uh, you can see the, the heel pads very, very prominent and the toe pads very, very prominent on a skunk track. Um, but he's a very, very short, kind of ovalish type foot right there. So that's a skunk. So this guy's got short and wide, and he's got webbing in between his five toes. Um, and the webbing obviously is, means that this guy's a semi-aquatic animal, um, and this is an otter. So he's got a wide set of feet, and he can spread those toes out so he can get the webbing in there so he can swim very, very fast. So um, wide set toes, webbing in between is an otter. Last one shows the front and the hind foot of a very, very common animal we have in Pennsylvania. Normally, what's interesting about these tracks is that you see front and hind foot next to each other, and then the next one's like this, and the next one's like this. So they walk the front left and the right hind is together, and then the front right and the hind left is together. Um, the, the long one is the hind foot, and it's got uh, very, very, almost no hair on the heel pad at all, so you see the perfect heel impression and long uh, toes that have no webbing in between, and then long front uh, feet, but you don't see um, any type of heel pad really sticking out on the front foot. So they have their half, the front foot is half the size of the hind foot, but when you see them, you usually see the, the front and the hind next, right next to each other when they're walking. They just have an unusual gait. So that's the raccoon. And that's a very, very common track everywhere in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> so that concludes this segment of the wildlife identification. We talked about skulls, but remember that you're going to be looking at skull pictures, not the actual skulls. We talked about scat, we showed you some examples of scat, and we talked about tracks, and we showed you all of the tracks um, that will be on the contest. Um, and so there is, on the, on the website, there's uh, study areas that you can go to to look at these different types of things. But what we try to do is kind of cover what, you know, the, the actual critters that you might actually see on the contest.